My name is Kenny Coleman. I'm an open source technical product manager here at VMware. I focus all on really Kubernetes, the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, I'm part of the Kubernetes release team as well. So anytime that you see a new version of Kubernetes come out, at least since 1.12, I've had some sort of hand in it. I am the Kubernetes 1.16 enhancement lead as well. So that will be released here in about four weeks is what we're targeting. Uh, code freeze is actually Thursday this week. So I've got my work cut out for me there. Uh, if I was to put my name in this vote, I am actually more jelly. I'm a more jelly kind of person. That's, uh, that's kind of the way I like, the, I like the sweet stuff. So Right on. Yeah, Tristan, go ahead. My name is Tristan. Whoa, hey, <laughs> my mic level's really high. Uh, my name is Tristan Todd. I'm a solution architect in government and education um, based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm definitely, I favor peanut butter. Um, I've been at VMware for about eight years. I come from a very VM-focused background. Um, let's see, so my role is I work with uh, state governments, large universities, uh, K-12 districts to help them make good, de good decisions about technology, and in some cases recommend VMware uh, solutions when it's appropriate. Sometimes? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. Yeah, only sometimes, I'm fairly agnostic. <laughs> so, uh, so let's get underway. Everybody got that? There'll be a quiz later, <laughs> all right? Everybody got that? Let's dive right in. So uh, you all, during lunchtime, came to a session on peanut butter and jelly, and um, I would be remiss and maybe liable if I didn't ask, is there anyone here with a nut allergy that we need to be aware of? Okay, there's a lot of peanut butter fans here, and somebody might have a sandwich stashed. So uh, Kenny actually came up with this title, had a, had a nice uh, curb appeal, I guess. Um, and from my perspective, um, my background in technology, I'm a peanut butter guy. Um, how many in the room have kind of built your career, your reputation, kind of your livelihood based on kind of core x86 virtualization besides me? So about half the audience. Did you all say that you liked peanut butter more than jelly? Because I think maybe we can say, Kenny, that peanut butter represents core x86 VM-centric virtualization? Sure, why not? Whereas jelly is perhaps, you know, the sweet, new, um, you know, saccharine taste of cloud-native container um, service-focused application infrastructure. And it's kind of uh, apparent, and I think based on the two keynotes that we just watched these first two days of VMworld, that containers are eating the world. So if you grew up in the world of x86 virtualization like I did, um, you saw a proliferation of VMs. You know, they're free, right? So why not order 20 if you're an application developer? And they grew at a very aggressive rate. But I don't think that we as traditionalists, at least myself, are prepared for kind of the cloud uh, native computing foundation explosion. This is just the current landscape of tools, some of them open source, some of them commercial, that are on the market and are disrupting kind of what we do as traditional uh, technologists in a data center or a cloud. Um, it's very hard to decipher this landscape, but what uh, some people feel, you know, sometimes late at night, I, I have this feeling, I'll self-identify, that if we as VM-focused uh, technologists don't focus and appreciate container-based development, this might be VMware's Palo Alto headquarters campus in like five years' time. Has anybody read a blog post about the end days of VMware? Anybody besides me? <laughs> Do I just have really bad Google searches that Maybe. I look for doom and gloom? Very targeted AdWords for you. Yes. Okay. So I'll let, uh, I'll let Kenny continue. Yeah, and to kind of really set the stage properly here, you know, we're not going to sit here and try to convince you that you should be running your applications all inside of virtual machines rather than containers. I mean, you've seen it from the keynotes in the past few days that this is the next evolution. This is exactly where the focus and the efforts are now being pushed for VMware. And so containers are radically changing the landscape of what we are trying to do and how we are packaging these applications. And the benefits are pretty vast of what you can get with inside a containerized infrastructure. So the idea here is when we have our applications finally containerized, how do we run this infrastructure best? And so our goal today is to really show you why VMware and why vSphere still plays a very critical role in doing this, and how you can actually run your virtual, or sorry, your containerized applications better or more efficient on virtual machines rather than trying to go into a bare metal route. So that's why we're going to look at really what kind of infrastructure are we trying to plan for today. 
And of course, this is all about focused around Kubernetes. Um, this was what's been talked about for the past two days. And you have to understand that Kubernetes is just one piece of the puzzle here, because this is the orchestrator, right? And when we look at what's happening here with inside of this type of architecture, it's going to map pretty similarly to what we already know today with inside of our vSphere environment. So you've got things like you've got your master, which is probably equivalent to what you think of vCenter, right? So your Kubernetes master is what's scheduling your pods or your containers onto individual worker nodes, where vCenter is scheduling or putting your virtual machines onto individual ESXi nodes. So you can kind of see that relationship on how it really matches there as well. At the same exact time, we have etcd, and we'll kind of talk more about the architecture here in a little bit. But our goal for all of this is to figure out how do we minimize the downtime or how do we make production time and making sure that you're up more, more often than not. And so when we start going down this path and you start figuring out, OK, I need to learn Kubernetes. How do I start getting into this? Um, and I want to start running this in a production type environment. You know, you start going out there and you'll start Googling. You say, OK, do I want to still do this? on top of vSphere, or I want to move to bare metal. And you go and do your Google search, and there's going to be a lot of vast opinions that are out there. And they're going to be going either way. It's going to say, you know, you're going to go all bare metal because you want the complete performance of what you can get out of that, that, that server. Or some people are going to say, no, you want to go and virtualize this because there's too many operational benefits that you can get besides just performance. And so when we're looking at this, we're going to look at uh, a few different ways on, on how we can do this because we don't want to go to the extreme uh, side and say that this is completely going to replace the hypervisor at all. But instead, there's just a lot of decisions that have to be made. You have to look at the pros and cons on either side to figure out what's going to work well for your environment based on the application that you need to run as well as the personnel that you have on staff as well to be able to manage it. So I'm from Oregon. So you know, this is a picture I took out of my Back, back bedroom window the other day. <laughs> so uh, Kenny and I wanted to address some, some myths about containers and bare metals, uh, excuse me, um, uh, containers and VMs kind of cohabitating or container technology running on virtual machine infrastructure and address you know, very directly some of the myths that are out there. And we thought a good way to do that would be to take a white paper that was published not too long ago that kind of categorizes you know, five big myths. I think we added a sixth. Yeah, we added a few in there. And this, was, this is from Diamante. This is a white paper that's out there today. And we took little quotes from it. And so we'll kind of show you exactly you know, what's part of it. So we want to be able to prove to you that what we're, what's coming to you from this particular white paper is not only just our, our rebuttal to say we must save the VM, right? But it's really to show you that there are operational and performance benefits that you can get by, still contain, or by having your containers in type of a, a virtualized environment. And to, to be honest, this paper makes a lot of really good arguments, and it's, it's got some good data. So we're not, we're not saying it's all wrong. We're saying um, maybe times are changing. Certainly um, Project Tanzu and Pacific are going to change um, our capabilities as technologists. So let's dive right in. So the first myth is that uh, each uh, VM consumes um, storage um, plus CPU for a full virtual machine, and that's before you even spin up any kind of um, containerized workload. So any um, any pod or uh, container cluster um, can't even get started doing its thing without all of the baseline um, load of the virtual machine OS, most often Linux. Um, and so this is a very, I think it's a very legitimate argument because at a large scale, if you add up all the processor cycles, all the RAM utilization, it's a, a heck of a lot of gear. And despite the fact that hardware costs have come down, um, you know, dedicating uh, for your masters, you know, a total of six masters necessary to maintain N plus one just to get started with Kubernetes runtime, you know, providing um, Kubernetes workers capability. It's, you know, effectively with bare metal, that's kind of um, six dedicated systems to maintain availability and performance just to get started. So that's kind of the bare metal argument. Uh, Kenny and I believe that um, actually mixing the workloads, so combining um, maybe um, spreading your masters across multiple physical nodes addresses some high availability concerns, some hardware abstraction, and also lets you gain some efficiencies because I think we all uh, as technologists have gotten really good at addressing uh, the noisy neighbor phenomenon. 
Uh, we've got some really good monitoring tools available to us to spot when a noisy neighbor situation is developing. Um, and we have some very good capacity insights capabilities so that we have a pretty good job of stretching physical hardware um, that is getting cheaper by the day um, a lot more. And it's okay to have kind of a heterogeneous workload running in that envir environment. And certainly we'll, we'll circle back to Project Pacific, but you know, we're taking it very seriously at the hypervisor level. Any thoughts, Kenny? Yeah, I mean, when you look at this as well and you want to, uh, actually, I'm going to start taking your next point, so you go ahead and, and talk about it too. So, so without, <laughs> without having to dedicate users to have unicorns in a data center or a cloud, we're really kind of embracing kind of the um, original, um, one of the original value adds of virtualization itself, which is you don't have to have specialized hardware performing an individual task where the life cycle of that physical asset, which is expensive to own and operate, is just addressing one uh, function in your, in your um, enterprise. Yeah, and to, to kind of uh, add on to this as well, so when we look at a Kubernetes architecture, you look at N plus one as the way that you're gonna be building this, and you look at resource utilization and availability here too, um, you're gonna have, as was kind of shown in the previous slide of actually having that, tip to that kind of architecture, if you're going the bare metal route, you're going to be utilizing a, a lot of wasted space in regards of how much, uh, how many different types of masters you're going to have, the etcd servers, how are you architecting this as well, so you're going to have um, a lot of wasted utilization resources too. Uh, another part to think about is, you know, when we start pulling our customers and figuring out how they are utilizing Kubernetes, more often than not, there are more smaller pockets of Kubernetes clusters rather than just one large Kubernetes cluster. So figuring out exactly how you can make that a uh, um, part of it too. So one of, the, one of the challenging things back in the early days of virtualization was you know, kind of buying the right compatible hardware to support uh, our hypervisor, whether it was GSX or ESX back in the day. Um, and now we've got a very good HCL, which supports an extensive amount of hardware and we provide a very clean runtime environment and we abstract all of the hardware complexity out of it. And we're getting increasingly good at orchestrating all of the hardware-esque things that need to happen. So BIOS and firmware uh, being addressed as well as hypervisor upgrades and virtual machine tools upgrades and the like. To have the same capability and peace of mind in a bare metal environment is pretty tricky. You know, you have to buy specialized hardware but you have to spend a lot more time, um, whether it's your data center or the cloud, if you're a cloud provider, um, addressing the underlying hardware, keeping it up to date, um, addressing, bless you, sir, uh, addressing a BIOS update that might uh, cause a problem with your application runtime environment. So we think that the core, one of the core values of virtualization, that hardware abstraction, is still very relevant today. Um, bare metal is, is challenged by this. Uh, Anybody here running Cloud Foundation um, on premises or VMC on AWS? Guy in the back row? All right. Um, Joe, you didn't raise your hand. All right. Joe from Riverside, I know he's running Cloud Foundation. One of the, uh, there's a couple of key capabilities with Cloud Foundation, which is um, the concept of what we call workload domains. And workload domain is a pocket of workload that is fairly uniform, that is all running on the same foundational physical. Um, and virtualized infrastructure with the similar or same or similar tool sets addressing it. So from a management standpoint, you know, common um, plane of monitoring, reporting, analysis, um, capacity planning and like, but all in a uh, very well supported and well um, understood hardware plane, but disparate workloads. So I think the demo this morning where we uh, showed Tanzu mission control showed kind of the combination of virtual machines, um, you know, maybe database workloads that drive an application, maybe IaaS um, type of applications or even VDI infrastructure cohabitating with container namespaces, pods and clusters that are running Kubernetes. So mixing the workloads with a common, um, you know, set of APIs, native Kubernetes declarative APIs, as well as well understood uh, vSphere APIs is a good thing at the top and then you have the peace of mind of the foundational physical layer. So we think that our capability and our focus is gonna make the Cloud Foundation story even stronger because we don't just run VMs. So. All right, next myth. 
So individual containers are stateless and ephemeral. Rather than moving a running container from one host to another, as you will with a VM, you should just start an instance on a new host. Sure, it makes sense. Uh, the, uh, containers themselves, they are ephemeral by nature. Uh, they contain no state. Uh, however, you can have stateful types of containers uh, that have its uh, data actually stored at some kind of persistence mechanism that's been attached to the container itself. Uh, however, we, have to, we can't discount essentially what VMware is also bringing to this table in regards of high availability and resource migration because that's been a huge selling point for vSphere through the longest time for traditional workloads. And now it's also making itself a selling point here as we start looking at cloud native world as well. So you got to be mindful first that the Kubernetes scheduler is actually super smart. It can actually take containers, it can schedule them on different worker nodes based on the uh, the size of the particular container, uh, any kind of auto-scaling policies that are put in effect, or just the amount of containers that are going onto each of these individual hosts too. Now, once that actually happens and Kubernetes places that container, nothing changes. It doesn't take into account anything for spikes in resource utilization or uh, any kind of host becoming starved for resources. Now, that means that if by some chance that that container could be, uh, I'm not going to say any, it's not going to have any failure, but it could become starved for resources there. Uh, there is a feature within inside of Kubernetes called priority and preemption. And what this does is it allows you as an administrator to actually go to an individual container or a deployment or a replica set, whatever you have, and apply a label. And for this, we'll just say like low, medium, and high. And what this means is that if you apply a label to this particular type of application or container and the, re and the host becomes starved, what, it's, what Kubernetes scheduler is going to do is actually kill off that container and spawn it on, another diff on a different host. So we look at this as, yeah, cool, that's, a, that's definitely something that can work here. Um, however, it doesn't necessarily give you the ability to actually kind of like have hands-off administration. Um, so now what we can do is we can actually start coupling this with DRS. And so if we can couple this with DRS, we now have the ability to have like a two-level or two-layer scheduling. And we can actually be able to just migrate and move virtual machines as needed to rebalance the cluster when we need to. And this also, you know, vMotion and DRS and all this other kind of stuff, this all plays into part of just routine operations that everybody has to go to because maintenance is just a necessary evil here. Servers need patches, you need to do hardware upgrades, you need to do everything else that you would do typically to take a server offline. Now, in the Kubernetes world, that's possible. Um, what you can do is you can do what's called draining or flushing a node. And by doing that, you essentially say, you put a command line to actually drain the node and all the containers start draining, the scheduler is gonna start pushing these off somewhere else. Now, also within the side of this part of the ecosystem here with HA, or sorry, with DRS, is understand that the Kubernetes control plane is super, super critical. Um, when you have a Kubernetes master, it is, it is like your vCenter. If you lose that master, you can't do anything to your individual host. Now, the workloads continue to run. However, you can't do anything to reschedule anything. Um, there could be connections lost if you're running like node port networking or anything like that. So having the ability to have a type of underlying infrastructure that can make uh, the Kubernetes master more resilient and less tolerant to risk is a huge benefit to this as well. Now, when we look at the individual types of containers that you're running, if they are stateless, this really doesn't make a good argument because if you have stateless applications such as web servers, more than likely they are spread out amongst multiple hosts anyway and they are being talked to through uh, a load balancer of some sorts. Now, in a stateful type of workload, um, we'll just take Postgres, for example. Uh, Postgres is a rewrite once type of uh, parameter that has to be put with inside of its deployment. This means that only one host can have a lock on the data store, and that's what's writing into it. Um, this is different than, say, something like GlusterFS, which has read write many, which allows many hosts to write to the database. So Postgres has that read write only or read write once type of uh, parameter set. With that, that means that any time that this container has to move, there will be downtime involved because you have to turn the container off or basically kill the container, 
spawn it off somewhere else, reconnect with storage to actually put it back to its own working uh, mechanism where it was before. So HA, or sorry, DRS plays a huge role again here as well by being able to just V motion all these um, to the next uh, host that's available. And then from there, it's, you're up and running. Now, the other part of this, and plus you wouldn't have to worry about like any kind of knowing the evacuation steps that you would need to know until you want to start figuring out what does my upgrade process look like for my Kubernetes nodes themselves. Um, most people, you could sit there and say, okay, let's drain a host. I'm going to run kubeadm. I'm going to upgrade this particular worker node, and then I'm going to put it back online. Uh, there's another ways that you can do this, and what virtualization is able to bring to this as well is that instead of having to upgrade the individual host, you can upgrade your master, make sure your master is online with the latest version. You can spin up a new virtual machine that has the new Kubernetes version into it, add it into the cluster, and you can, uh, you can now flush and drain another worker, take it offline, remove it from the cluster. So that's another way that you can go and think about your upgrade process as you're going through here too. Now, as we start diving down this path of just higher availability, we understand that failure is inevitable pretty much anywhere we look. And we have to ask ourselves as well is like, do we trust our, um, our should I say, do we trust that our developers are, are writing this in a way that it is you know, quote unquote cloud native or is it being distributed or is it realizing that it's utilizing distributed resources as well? Uh, how often are they running their tests? Because we want to make sure that there's a lot of things that we want to think about um, to make sure that it can actually withstand any types of failures. So what we want to do is we want to not only just think of our application failure domain, but our infrastructure failure domain. And this means that my application uh, needs to be able to fit into this one. Now, at the same exact time, we can use something like that Postgres example we just talked about. Now, Postgres is not what we would consider a cloud-native type of database but we can package it inside of a container and we can get all the benefits that containerized applications give us. So just because you're putting something in a container doesn't mean that it's gonna be automatically cloud native. However, it is giving you an opportunity to repackage a lot of the applications that you might be utilizing today, whether they're homegrown or anything like that, into a container and you can take advantages of, these, uh, of the benefits underlying here. Now from a failure domain perspective, uh, this is, again, this is where uh, this is actually going to come in and play for HA because if you have, in the Kubernetes world, if you have a node that goes down, there's a five-minute timeout. There's a, there's a node heartbeat that goes between the, uh, the worker node to the master, and it's all calculated and stored with inside of etcd. And if by some chance that node goes down, you've got a five-minute window, and if that five-minute window elapses, those containers that are running on that host are then rescheduled off into in the, inside of the cluster. Now, of course, HA, on the other hand, has a smaller failure time for that. So you can actually invoke HA, move that virtual machine over to a, a new host at this point in the case of any type of failure, and then you're up and running again. You didn't actually need to reschedule those pods anywhere else, right? So uh, HA and DRS play a huge critical role into making sure that you still have higher availability and more distributed uh, ways that you can actually put resources across your clusters at the same exact time. Just out of curiosity, has anybody had a big kind of application down event that in the last you know, couple months that caused you a lot of pain, brought into sharp relief that business continuity DR is critical? Anybody? Just, just three people? <laughs> That's Sam? It. Everybody else is just, they're just painful, they're right? Masters, masters Every, painful. Everybody should have a script. You should take your tier one apps and write a script so if there's downtime, it updates your LinkedIn profile so <laughs> that you're ready to go with the next steps, right? So um, moving on to the next myth. Um, because containers are small, they're, they're micro, you should be able to squeeze a lot more application components on a single physical server object. Um, and this is a really valid argument because um, if you can imagine, you know, a, a very dense ESXi host that might be able to run, you know, 50 or maybe 75 virtual machines, um, you could maybe multiply that by 10 with, with containers, with workers, with uh, microservices running on that individual physical entity. Um, so that's a, kind of a tantalizing um, proposition, except all of those individual runtime components are very critical they're very important, and to jam them all your eggs into one basket 
um, a lot more eggs into one uh, basket, um, is potential devastating if you have a physical um, host failure. They do happen, even in this day and age. So um, automating recovery capabilities, automating scalability, for instance, during um, Chase, you know, at your, uh, at your university during enrollment, if you have to spawn lots of workers to keep up with application load in a student information system or uh, maybe some kind of a student enrollment system, that kind of burst is sometimes very hard to orchestrate back in physical resources in the way that we've gotten really good at um, spinning up resources or um, auto-provisioning resources with a hypervisor at play. So a common command set, um, you know, declarative API capability in Kubernetes married with a well-known, well-understood, well-documented API structure in vSphere, it gives you the best of both wor worlds because you can address application burst, but you can also uh, address periodic resource consumption bursts on the back end. And it's kind of a key capability. Uh, Project Pacific, um, you know, putting the Kubernetes runtime environment parallel or, or native to the hypervisor is powerful because you bring two very well-known, um, powerful API command structures together to let you do a lot at the application and the physical infrastructure layer. Any, any uh, additional thoughts, Kenny? This is just a, a component to, basically the, the main argument here is that automating bare metal is very, very, very difficult. Right, so being able to utilize this in just well-documented APIs that talk to vCenter, set new VMs, from there you can load in Salt or Ansible or whatever it is to actually load in uh, Docker and Kubernetes and install everything, is gonna be a lot easier than trying to figure out, okay, how do I take something that's uh, sitting vacant in a rack and add it into a cluster uh, and automate bare metal? It, it's very, very difficult, right? And, and so massive service providers like AWS, Alibaba, Azure, they rely on a hypervisor layer because they benefit from all the automation because the technology doesn't quite exist yet that we have a flying drone that has a claw on it that grabs a physical server off a shelf, flies around a data center, racks it and cables it, and gets it ready for bare metal workload. So that's what we're talking about here. Maybe the drone can get it like a Raspberry Pi or something, but yeah, you're not doing too much... You're ruining too much, not much computing power there. You're ruining my container ship <laughs> analogy. So, uh, you know, Kenny, Kenny likes bourbon, and he likes to import bourbon and ship bourbon around the country. You can imagine how devastated he would be if one of these containers contained some of his favorite product. Very true. Um, I think we've all suffered as virtual, machi mach virtual machine um, evangelists, administrators, of overrunning an ESXi cluster, a vSphere cluster, with too many VMs. Like there's a run on the bank, you know, or maybe you um, get fancy and start setting memory limits or oversharing memory resources. There's a run on the bank and the infrastructure topples over. With the aggressive uh, scalability impact of containerized application workloads, this effect is compounded and can be compounded. And so it's essential to kind of recognize the value of that hypervisor and the ability to monitor in real time, and in some cases, AI-based predictive resource consumption when those storms are coming. And if you look back in history, when those storms have occurred uh, on a seasonal basis or on a periodic basis, so that you don't end up having uh, your core network infrastructure, in this case a ship, toppled under the top heavy weight of a big containerized workload. All right, I think this next one, it's gonna, it's gonna hit home here. So the people using and managing the container environment are likely not the same ones managing the VM environment, no matter how well your container virtualization and infrastructure teams work together, there will inevitably be communication problems, duplication of effort, and unavoidable delays as one team waits on another. Ouch, it stings a little bit, right? I mean, they're basically saying that as a virtualization engineer, you don't know how to manage a containerized infrastructure or a network infrastructure or anything like that. So one thing that we can never overlook is the, over, is the value between personnel and teams. And so there's gonna be different needs and different perspectives of, of what you see on here. So whether we're the, uh, the operators, the infrastructure engineers, we are looking at how do we keep the performance high for our developers? How do we maintain security policies to know that our data is not getting leaked out any, anywhere? Uh, we already talked and covered about availability because making sure that our applications are up and running makes sure that we don't have to update our LinkedIn profiles too often. 
Um, and then, we, of course, we have to worry about the cost and what does that look like for our individual uh, centers as well. And the devs on the other side, they want to just write code. They want to be able to create their applications uh, and own the applications too, right? And this is really what we're talking about of how the, the types of uh, personalities have changed with inside of many organizations where they're looking at creating more of a DevOps types of, uh, types of teams where developers and the operations teams are working together to try to achieve this kind of unity or this collaboration to make sure that no matter who is writing or owning it, um, they're all kind of working together for a common need here. So as I kind of mentioned, you know, one of the most overlooked things with inside of the, uh, inside of the IT environment are the people in itself. So you can easily quantify the cost that you would have with software or with capital assets, but what about the training that goes into people like you all of actually having a competent staff that can actually take care and operate the backend infrastructure? I think, I think, Kenny, in some cases, it's um, traditional virtualization people. We speak a different language than application development teams. So in some cases, it's not a failure to communicate. It's just we're speaking two different languages. So us kind of up-leveling our application speak capability is valuable to dev teams, just as well as them understanding a little bit more about what we do. Yeah. I'm also here to, like, to give you all a pat on the back, right? Like, this is what this slide is all about. Because, you know, when you're adopting a new technology, it's more than just the technology that you're adopting. You're adopting everything else that's around it. You're, you've got to take into monitoring. You've got to take into business continuity. How is it? Uh, what kind of tooling is going into it? Are there more processes? All of that is, is part of this. And as you're starting to go down this journey, you know, whether you've been fighting containers for the longest time or not, but this is also healthy for the growth of yourself to actually start learning newer types of technology. Um, but you don't want to sit there and duplicate a lot of efforts. You don't want to rip and replace things. You don't want to just say, okay, well, we're going to get rid of our virtualization environment. We're going in all in Kubernetes um, because at that point, you're, you're basically just duplicating the effort of what now do I have to manage. Uh, odds are that's never going to happen. You're still going to have your two types of environments. So if you were to go down this path and saying, okay, well, we're just going to create one environment now that's going to be completely bare metal, that's going to be running all of our Kubernetes workloads, you're essentially duplicating the efforts. Um, you're going to have another silo, another team, uh, somebody else that's going to have to sit there and manage the actual bare metal components of it, rather than looking at something as utilizing the vSphere platform. We've seen this journey happen before, right? Everybody remembers OpenStack, right? We played with OpenStack. Where did you test it out on? VMware, right? You started playing around with Docker. Where did you test it out on? You started testing around on virtual machines. Right? So this is just yet another evolution of the journey of where we continue to start seeing of how we can start driving more focus on here and utilizing our existing investments that we already have in virtualization uh, to help that. And not only that is when we start looking at management in the environment, we start looking at the, the actual, everything from the application southbound into the infrastructure. So we have Kubernetes in itself. It comes with a dashboard if you want to expose it. You can get information about individual namespaces or the performance of the containers and stuff like that. Uh, however, it's really lacking anything for the underpinning infrastructure. Um, if you were to go to the bare metal route and you're trying to figure out exactly how do I monitor everything in a bare metal environment, um, there's only a very small select few of vendors out there that actually know how to communicate and talk to uh, the Kubernetes API to pull a lot of this sort of stuff out. So within here, uh, we're, we're starting to layer on different things. So you've got the Kubernetes piece that is now focusing pretty much from the application southbound and the infrastructure, and we've got vCenter as well. So vCenter is, gonna, again, it's going to be pulling your infrastructure, getting the actual physical uh, health and stats of your underlying nodes uh, from the, the actual hardware pieces, and you couple this all together with something like Wavefront, uh, and you can actually get the complete holistic view from the application down into the infrastructure too. And if you want to even tack on, say, something from the vRealize suite, you're going to get more of those uh, real-time analytics of what you can get from the actual infrastructure side as well. Cool. Thanks. So I think the day one keynote, I think we brought into sharp relief some of the testing that we've done with kind of prototypes, you know, early, um, early versions of Pacific and the fact that we saw greater virtualization um, density um, with Kubernetes workloads um, running on uh, vSphere. And uh, 
there's probably some contention here because um, obviously Diamante found a study or, or carried out a study where they found a very different experience between bare metal and Kubernetes running on a virtualized platform. Um, however, there's some, so there's some tricks that, that we play with the hypervisor um, with vSphere that are pretty powerful. Um, instead of worrying about um, nuanced hardware that is bare metal capable, um, we have a kind of a broad ecosystem of, of hardware uh, devices that we support that have different characteristics. More cores, more memory, uh, higher um, uh, speed networking capabilities, um, obviously um, IO capable cards on the back. If you're driving pure storage, don't forget your HBAs, make sure they're solid, right? Yeah. It's like driving a Lamborghini on a dirt road, right? So the idea is to recognize that the hypervisor does a lot of things um, to enhance performance. Um, so direct path IO, uh, single root IO virtualization, these let us capitalize on um, storage and networking traffic. Uh, the NUMA scheduler, I think we got a slide on the NUMA scheduler. The NUMA scheduler and the fact that we can make sure that we align CPU and memory consumption and we uh, properly schedule a multi socket host to share workload. With, with disparate uh, systems running on them. These are really powerful capabilities that help uh, drive better performance, higher density, um, and we're constantly kind of figuring out ways to squeeze more um, from a time scheduling perspective out of, um, you know, hardware that is, is even in this world of cheaper hardware, um, still fairly sparse. So with bare metal, you don't always have these capabilities, these intelligent ways to prioritize traffic, set um, prioritization um, of particular workloads. You know, for instance, take a namespace and say, this namespace is 2x more important than this namespace, and making sure that you have um, kind of fairness, um, except in times of contention. What we've been doing with resource pools for years, the same type of resource pool and tag-based approach to uh, sharing workloads, on a common hardware platform, but making some workloads a little bit more important th than others scientifically. Yeah, Any I mean, I think to, to kind of tail onto that as well, you know, to, to kind of put like a summary of like what does this actually mean is that at the very beginning, you know, it said like, yes, uh, it, I think there was a thing in here that said, you know, bare metal gives 30% uh, greater performance over a vSphere and, a, and, a, and a just kind of like if you were to container or sorry, virtualize the, the nodes themselves. Um, and you probably saw in the keynote yesterday announcing Project Pacific that like all of a sudden now we have 8% greater performance than bare metal. When you go through any of these, everybody's going to tailor a study for what makes them look best, right? Let's not lie to ourselves. Now, the real, what we're trying to see here is that if you are looking at a, at a slightly better performance uh, advantage that you're going to get with bare metal, does that really outweigh the cost of everything that we've talked about already? The availability portion of it, um, the ability to not actually said have to have to have a uh, uh, an H your own HCL for your own Kubernetes environment, right? Because any time that you want to even make a change to uh, a particular piece of hardware, you're going to be in and up like having to sit there and okay, I want to do a firmware upgrade on my HBA or whatever it is. What's this going to mean in, in in terms of is this now supported underneath this particular Linux OS? that is then now running my Kubernetes uh, worker nodes and so on and so forth. And so it's, yeah, I, think it, I think it's tough too because we all know that sometimes you buy a particular model server and it's available for four months, six months, and you get really good at doing BIOS and firmware updates and you go to buy another one because you know how to manage it. Maybe you know how to do some automation. There's some tools in place. You go to buy the next server and you find out that model has changed. Oh, it's a diff different motherboard. It's a different host bus adapter or a set of NICs. And then you realize, oh, I have a different method that I need to use to orchestrate and maintain that system. Um, with vSphere, we've got a lot of customers um, that in fact mix some of their nodes. Um, so our best practice is always make your ESXi hosts in a cluster as uniform as possible. But back when I was a, a, a system admin running a big vSphere farm, I, you know, sometimes I had some strawberries and some raspberries in the same cluster and things just worked just fine. You, you talked about storage, and I used to be kind of a storage junkie, uh, and this kind of brings up a, another point I was just thinking about, is that if you are looking at running Kubernetes in a bare metal environment, you have to figure out, okay, how am I going to attach and how am I going to have persistent storage that's going to be available to my containers? So what's inside of Kubernetes today, uh, you've got two ways to make this happen. So you've got the internal um, 
entry drivers that are shipped as part of the Kubernetes core code. And that, you actually haven't been able to add a new, um, a new vendor into it since about 111 or 112. Kubernetes said no more. Uh, because any change that actually had to happen, say there was a, uh, a small performance enhancement or a bug that needed to happen with inside of, say, we'll just say AWS with the EBS driver, uh, you had to actually wait for the Kubernetes release cycle to make any changes to that particular driver. So the goal is to actually move this all out of tree. And I'll talk about this here in a second. So if you were to move to a bare metal environment and you want to attach storage to a, uh, to a worker node, you have to have some type of driver of what Kubernetes can talk to. I'm going to guess on a 99% basis that you're not going to be able to do this with bare metal, um, at least not anymore. And I, I tell this because I was part of the team back at EMC that actually wrote the scale I.O. driver for Kubernetes, and it was part of the entry, core, uh, entry code. Uh, since then, it's all been abandoned, right? And we were actually one of the only ones that we were, and I, I mean, I, when, before I came to VMware, I was big on board with this. We were doing everything with scale I.O., and I said, okay, this is awesome. Like, we don't need VMware. We don't need the hypervisor tax. We can save all the money with not having all these licenses anymore. And when we were doing this, we were building it, and it took me to VMware when I actually had to write a lot of these arguments. Um, I was just like, oh, I used, to be the, I used to be the bare metal person. Like, it's cool. Like, but I never actually had to do operations with it. Um, we were actually emulating everything in software when we were writing these drivers, right? So we were actually utilizing virtual machines to make this all happen. So we were theoretically building bare metal, but never actually having to actually operate it. Now, that that entry driver for Scale.io is defunct, it's deprecated, it's no longer there anymore. Um, but the next move forward is utilizing what's called CSI, or the Container Storage Interface. So the Container Storage Interface is the next iteration of, of what this is. Uh, vSphere today has an in driver tree, and then the CSI driver is currently in development as well. So you're gonna see that start coming to, uh, I think it was G8 and 114 for CSI, but there's a lot of things for uh, resizing and things that are being added into it. Uh, today, there are no storage enhancements that are happening in the entry code. Um, if you go and you talk to any kind of storage vendors that are out there on the floor and they say, oh yeah, we've got our own Kubernetes plugin, they might be talking about flex. There's a, there's a flex volume driver, which at the end of the day is a Band-Aid. Um, it's also been abandoned by pretty much anybody in the Kubernetes community because nobody is putting any effort into writing anything for flex anymore. So everything's moving towards CSI. So if you're looking at moving into that type of direction and you want to go bare metal, heaven forbid, you actually need to make sure that they are developing a CSI driver that can then interact with Kubernetes. Now, if you're running this on top of vSphere, you're going to be okay because we have the entry driver, which is today the kind of our gold standard, what's still used until CSI becomes a little bit more mature. But when you do this, anything that's supported underneath VMware, you know, the hundreds of storage vendors that are there, are automatically supported now with inside of Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes, like VMware brings that abstraction layer from any type of data store that you want to bring with it and can now map it into here. So this is, that's really what we're seeing here is what you can really map that type of stuff. Now, one of the arguments that uh, wasn't mentioned in that particular PDF was anything about security. So we'll do it for you, um, because I think it's pretty easy to say that virtualization is gonna provide a much better security footprint than you can with just doing anything inside of bare metal. And security's always been a concern with containers. You've, there's already been documented reports of having memory leaks showing between containers. You can have uh, a mismatch of permissions uh, that allow a container to actually talk to, uh, two different containers to talk to the same exact volume. Uh, you can have root privileges on a container. If you do that, you're not utilizing user IDs, then the root user actually has access to the file system of the host itself. So there's really not a shortage of things that you have to worry about and being concerned with this. But if you're on the fearful side, this is one of the things to consider when you come to vSphere because a virtual machine actually starts creating that, that sort of that barrier. And not only that, is now you have the flexibility to size your virtual machines to your kind of whatever your comfort level is, right? So if you feel that, okay, well, let's just go ahead and add 32 vCPUs and, uh, you know, terabyte of RAM and have this massive thing, uh, and you can have a ton of containers on it, 
or do you want to minimize that footprint and create much smaller VMs as well? So this is being able to give you that lower level of risk uh, tolerance that you would, that you could have, versus something in a bare metal environment where you're going to be putting a ton of stuff on a server that's probably pretty dense at the end of the day. And so if we look at the past two years uh, of stuff that's been coming out, you know, hardware vulnerabilities uh, have been coming out too. So you've had things uh, such as Heartbleed and Meltdown and Spectre and all that sort of stuff that's been happening. But VMware has always been one of the first ones that ship code on actually having to patch these things. Um, not only that, is it shipping patches on hardware that is pretty much probably no longer supported by many of the vendors that are out there as well, right? Everybody's gotten that EOL statement in their email and been like, damn it, not another one, right? So uh, that's one thing that you can look at when you start looking into here as well. Uh, and if you were to do this in a bare metal environment, you think of, well, how fast can I patch this? How fast can I get this server patched? Um, we all love a trusted tool set of Update Manager, right? We can put a host into maintenance mode, move everything off, upgrade that patch, or put the patch in, and then you're back up and running. So trying to figure out how you can automate, uh, you know, roll out something like that in a bare metal environment is going to be very, very tough to do. Now there's other security features that are being built into this too by individual CPU manufacturers like AMD. They created secure, and I have to read the notes here, secure encrypted virtualization with encrypted state, SEVES. And that actually builds upon the original SEV, but what this does, it actually creates a smaller attack surface and it creates an additional layer of protection from the guest VM to the hypervisor if by some chance the hypervisor does become uh, I guess you could say uh, if it becomes hacked or anything like that during the process, or compromise is probably the best way to put this too. So when we start looking at the, the individual components of what like Kubernetes brings to the forefront here, so if we were just looking at just standard Linux, running this on bare metal, this is really what Kubernetes gives you, right? It gives you environmental consistency, knowing that you can containerize an application and it's gonna run the same exact way no matter where you go. This is a huge benefit over virtualization. You know, we can think that we can take a virtual machine and move it anywhere, but odds are you can't take a virtual machine that's running, say, on VMware Fusion and just, just say, pop it over and just move it over onto uh, uh, vSphere. It doesn't work like that. Versus a container, it, it actually can. You, contain, you containerize something, it's a runtime environment, and knowing the layers exactly how it works. And so you can run that in any cloud, whether it's on-premise, off-premise, anything like that. Um, and then you've also got the ability to say, I can create different roles in type of Kubernetes. I can have my infrastructure people manage the, uh, the different types of uh, hardware components or the different types of infrastructure for the masters and the etcd servers. And then my developers have the ability to provision and spawn instances whenever they want. Now, we take this and we start saying, okay, now if we add in vSphere into here, all the other different components that are available now too that we've kind of talked about. So you've got a single platform for all your applications added security layers that we had just mentioned. You can tightly couple network virtualization. We didn't really talk about that a little bit. In a bare metal environment, if you have to have some sort of network policies that say, I need to limit my pod to pod communication, I need to put a firewall between these pods, odds are you're not gonna be able to do that with east-west traffic. You probably have to do it north-south. So those packets have to leave, go and talk to a firewall, and then come back. So a little bit low on the network latency side, also on the network side is you're going to have these things called load balancers that you're going to need. You can actually emulate load balancers with NSXT inside of software. And you would have to do this outside with some sort of external party that is now a supported mechanism for doing load balancer primitives inside of Kubernetes, right? So they have to actually have a Kubernetes plugin for the network side to actually make that, and that's part of CNI or the container networking interface. Uh, we had talked about abstracted interoperability for storage and having all the hundreds of vendors that are available there too. Comprehensive high availability with DRS and HA. And then we can automate as much as we can for scaling or any kind of purposes like that if you were to just build this on top of yourself. And so as we start looking into really like what's on the horizon here at VMware, you know, VMware Tanzu has been announced, um, and we're going to see more things that are becoming from Project Pacific, as well as utilizing things like VMware PKS. In the meantime, to look and see, this is how we are going to build Kubernetes on top of vSphere. Right? This is how we're still going to manage and how we're going to own a lot of these applications uh, that are running in that containerized environment. So if you want to start learning more about Kubernetes, uh, there was something that had just launched and talked about this morning. 
You can go to kubernetes.academy. This is a uh, series of uh, blog posts and videos to get you uh, up to speed on just how to start building and operating and managing Kubernetes. It is very agnostic. It doesn't say anything about, oh, you should run this on vSphere. Instead, it's just Kubernetes technology in general. Yeah, if you want to learn how to speak containers in Kubernetes, and you want to start from zero and get to 200 level, this is a fantastic resource, and we do sponsor it, but it is, it is kind of focused on open source. So it is, uh, it's a great place if you want to kind of learn how to you know, speak the lingo of, of app dev and cloud native. Start with Docker first, move to Kubernetes next. That's what I always tell people, because Docker is really going to be your, your core component of what runs the container, and then Kubernetes is your, your orchestrator that tells you where all these are going. Um, if you're looking at wanting to build uh, on your own environment just for testing, there's a great resource at blod.cloud. This was done by Miles Gray uh, of actually creating a golden image utilizing Ubuntu. Uh, it's relying on DHCP if your environment is there. I actually had to build mine utilizing CentOS and static IPs, so your mileage may vary there. Uh, and then the second one is actually setting up Kubernetes with the vSphere cloud provider, which is that internal entry um, kind of uh, plug in there, and utilizing kubeadm to spin up and build your cluster. Uh, I actually did a demo of this yesterday at my session. I'll be doing another demo of this on Thursday at 9.30 if you want to come and check that out too. Uh, and then the last one is actually utilizing the vSphere Cloud Provider. Uh, that's going to talk to either vSAN or a data store that you're providing it to create storage classes and um, persistent applications. Um, I automated a bunch of this with a, a gist right there. Don't worry about writing that down because that's way too much. Uh, other resources is that there is a VMware hands-on lab that you can go and check out Enterprise PKS. There's a few different um, lessons inside of there that is just standard. This is how you do things in Kubernetes. So it is not all just all enterprise PKS, but instead it is a little agnostic so you can learn things just about Kubernetes themselves. And then there's two other sessions to go and check out. Um, today at 3.30, there is a keynote with Craig McLucky. He is one of our senior VPs here, one of the founders of uh, Kubernetes. So please go and check that out, as well as Paul Fazone. And then, let's see, and we've got a, a, a Project uh, Pacific deep dive tomorrow, 1130, uh, that if you want to know how we're kind of creating the Kubernetes runtime within vSphere, um, recommend you check that session out. It's going to be really interesting. We do have a blog post that we published yesterday morning that is kind of a technical under the covers, um, but this will be a lot more kind of detailed. You can ask some tough questions. So please fill out your survey. We have... Uh, and thank you. And we've got uh, time for a few questions. We've got seven minutes left. If you have a question, please go to the microphone because this is being recorded. If you go to the microphone, you will get a piece of chocolate, okay? No questions? Everybody wants lunch? Oh, we got one. All right, go to the microphone for us. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. This is really good. So I have a question. You said there is multi-level scheduling between uh, vMotion, HA, and DRS, and Kubernetes management, right? Orchestration. Would there be any conflict? In, uh, for example, if Kubernetes orchestration would be moving the containers to different hosts, could the DRS be doing different based on its own policies? Yeah, so there are going to be some recommended practices that are going to be, you know, basically you need to uh, make some adjustments to the schedulers themselves to know that they're not going to be hitting the same kind of time limits and time bombs. Um, so you're not, going to, you're not going to notice it first off, right? I mean, like for the most part, a lot of the defaults are going to be okay, but if you really want to get into the weeds of it, yeah, you can, you can tweak some of the parameters that you would have for uh, the failover and timeouts. Um, and when I say this, it's, it's, like, um, it's not really like a multi-layer or two-level scheduling. It's saying that like Kubernetes is scheduling all your containers, and then you've got vCenter that's kind of like taking care of scheduling of where your underlying infrastructure resources are. So it can completely balance the cluster as it needs um, based upon, you know, vCenter is going to be looking at its undercore lying infrastructure, seeing if there's resources available over here. I'm going to go ahead and move this machine. Um, now, as I had mentioned earlier, Kubernetes isn't going to be respawning or, or, or flushing or draining any kind of uh, containers unless you set anything with priority and preemption. So if you don't do that, once you place a container on an individual host, that container is not going anywhere. 
right? So utilize DRS as a, as a capability underneath to let it move and get more resources if by ch some chance this container with inside of this virtual machine sees some sort of resource spike, right? Okay, so basically DRS is giving you the feedback of what is available and which things are, which of the pieces of hardware are underutilized, and that kind of gives you the hints for the orchestration to move the containers around. So the so DRS and Kubernetes are not talking to one another. Oh, they don't. No, they do not talk to one another today. Um, this is something that is uh, a future investigation that we're doing as yeah. part of the uh, rewrite of the of the entry driver. Uh, is to figure out how can the the cluster and DRS, the cluster scheduler and and DRS actually talk more in line, uh, because we want to make sure that, uh, especially as we start looking at multi-cluster vMotion, that you still have, uh, you're bound to that particular failure domain or that particular domain of where your storage is actually accessible. Uh, because today you can create, you could have say two different uh, vCenter, or not vCenter clusters, I'm sorry, two different um, clusters with inside of your same vCenter, and you could span Kubernetes across all of them. However, Everybody kind of knows that a particular data store is really only matched to one, 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 one cluster. And so if by some chance this, uh, this got actually moved, or sorry, if, 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 a, um, if a container got spawned into a different cluster, it wouldn't be able to access that storage, right? So there are things that we are going to be developing in the next iteration to figure out how can we have the Kubernetes uh, clusters actually span multiple vCenter clusters. Okay, cool. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Have a great day. Have a great rest of VMworld. Thanks for sticking around, all seven of you. Yeah. <laughs>